Good afternoon once again. Uh, it's a, indeed a pleasure to be here today to speak to all the young and vibrant audience. Uh, the theme of the presentation today is a very, very favorite and a, uh, a topic which is dear to my heart. It's called Reimagine the Future with Generative AI. Um, what I'll do is, while we talk about future, I would like to take you through uh, 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 memories of some of the profound statements made by uh, you know, research scientists, uh, analysts, uh, and, and academicians in the past. So just look at what people have been talking about, uh, you know, the, the future as they see at that point of time. Some of the notable ones being the flight part. I mean, just read the statement and you'll realize that how difficult it is to predict the future. Uh, the statement that was made that time was that flight by machines heavier than air is impractical and insignificant, if not utterly impossible. Now what you can also see that this statement was made precisely 18 months before Wright brothers flew the first plane in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. So just imagine that the prediction that was made in 1902 turned out to be uh, false in just about 18 months. Moving on to the technology predictions that were made in the past, you can see that there are three very, very impactful uh, predictions that have not come to be true. The first one being uh, Thomas Watson's statement that I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Just imagine, uh, IBM leader is talking about the demand for computers being just about five globally. The second one being Dr. Humi Baba, where he said a big country like India I think there would be a legitimate case for having two computing centers and getting two computes. And where are we today? I mean, we will have perhaps more than 200 just in Mumbai alone, you know, a big computers mainframes. Uh, the, the, the other one in 1977 is even more profound. It was made by DEC uh, chief Ken Olson. And what he said was that there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in his home. Just imagine, you know, uh, making a statement like this that there is no need to have a computer at home. Today, we are all, you know, walking machines. You know, we have everything. Just look at me. You know, I have got so many gadgets on me right now uh, that, that the, you know, every one of us is carrying a cell phone, which is nothing less than a computer. So it is always not very easy to make predictions. But one prediction that I can make very, very strongly, which cannot go wrong, and that is that the generative uh, AI is going to disrupt the world like never before. And this is the session where I'm going to talk about how can Gen AI uh, can, can actually transform the businesses and can give a meaningful career options to the students at large. What I have seen over a period of last three decades, uh, I have been uh, working very closely with IT organizations globally and meeting customers world over. You know, in, in early 80s, 90s, the conversation we used to have with the, with the customers used to be, you know, what do they need? What kind of skills they want? And we used to always offer skills in multiple different technology areas, maybe mainframe technologies, maybe uh, Oracle, maybe SAP technologies. Over a period of time, the demand from the customers changed. They said, no, now we don't really require just, uh, you know, just a talent or a, or a, or a body. What we really need is a definitively, uh, you know, outcome-based projects based on the specification that I give. So the customer needs to define the problem statement and they used to share it with us. And they used to say, this is my problem. Please help me solve this problem by developing computer applications. And we used to do that. And that was basically getting into the more like managed services mode. The world moved on. The customers moved on. And now today, the customers are saying that I really don't know what my problem is. To come and look at my, my business, look at my business model, look at my operating model and tell me what kind of you know, problems uh, I have currently and how can I actually be more competitive in the marketplace. Around the same time, there were two things that happened. And the first thing is the competitive landscape changed dramatically. You know, in 1980s, 90s, you know, the, the conversation we used to have is to uh, you know, create efficiencies in factories. I'll give an example. If you look at Honda versus Toyota versus Ford Motors, you know, the, the discussion point was that how can I make my factory of Honda versus 
factory of Toyota and factory of uh, Ford Motors more efficient. And the competition used to be the factory operations. Efficiency in factory manufacturing, in, 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 in building the, the components, building the machines, assembly lines, all of that. Uh, the technology also was client server architecture, pretty archaic at that point of time. Later on, things moved and moved quite dramatically. What happened was, while technology moved on, internet uh, was, was becoming pervasive and, uh, and the whole connected ecosystem started emerging. And at that point of time, the customers were actually looking at not just their factory premises, but they were looking at the entire supply chain. What does that mean? So while at one point of time, the competition was predominantly around the factory operations of Honda versus Toyota versus Ford, now they are looking at the competition between the supply chain of uh, Honda versus supply chain of Toyota versus Ford. So the whole uh, level of conversation that was hap happening about the competitiveness changed. And that was because the whole uh, supply chain was connected at that point of time. What do you mean by supply chain uh, competitiveness? That means that your supplier has to be efficient. You need to have your dealer distributors uh, efficient. You should have your manufacturing also equally efficient. The world moved on. Then we started looking at you know, IoT, Industry 4.0, and we'll take entire connected ecosystem. And at that point of time, what happened was the whole competitive landscape changed from supply chain competitiveness to ecosystem competitiveness. What does that mean? That means that now the, the, the whole conversation, whole environment within which these companies used to operate completely changed and their efficiencies were measured based on ecosystem efficiencies. What does ecosystem mean? Ecosystem of Honda versus ecosystem of Toyota and Ford means that not just the supply chain, but also the way they were generating finance, also the way they were marketing their, their equipments or their, their end products. How were they, uh, you know, designing the automobiles, you know, that was getting, you know, manufactured in their plants. So the entire uh, ecosystem competitiveness actually uh, was, was becoming extremely prevalent. And that's the way the transition happened over a period of last maybe three or four decades. The technology, as I was mentioning, also moved on. Today, the whole conversation is about big data, you know, uh, robotic process automation, AI, ML, AR, VR. So the whole technology landscape also has, has undergone a massive, massive change. This is a simple example, and this is an example of, uh, you know, equipment maintenance. You know, I, I, I know of a, of a company for which we are, we are providing services for several years now. This is a global elevator manufacturing company. And uh, the, the kind of service level agreements that they need to have is completely different and absolutely futuristic. Now, what does that mean? Uh, the, the, the vision of this elevator manufacturing company is that in case uh, there is an elevator uh, in, in Beijing which is servicing 140 storied building and there are multiple elevators there and if, if that elevator gets stuck let's say on the 83rd platform, uh, 83rd floor, the control room in, in Australia will actually get the alert much before the, the, the consumers of that building realize that there is an elevator which is not working. So that's the kind of a, you know, competitiveness people want. If suppose somebody is giving me a service like this, where I don't even know that elevator in my building is actually malfunctioning, but the, uh, you know, the, the, the manufacturer of the equipment is actually telling me that there is a problem. Here is a field service uh, technician who is on his way and he should get the elevator fixed in the next 60 minutes. Just imagine the level of service people are, uh, you know, expecting in nowadays. And that's precisely what is you know being shown in this particular slide. So here is what uh, going to transform and disrupt the world altogether. While all of us are looking at you know AI, ML, AR, VR, I think what is going to disrupt the world today is going to be generative AI. Now I'll give up a little bit of introduction about what Gen AI is and how it can be relevant uh, to the students at large. You know, how can they make careers using Gen AI? What kind of opportunities they have, uh, you know, especially in the technology area? So those are the, uh, you know, points that are extremely relevant to uh, the audience out here right now. But one thing, you know, is, is definitive that generative AI is here to stay. It is going to disrupt the world. 
already there are indicators and the data points which I will be covering, which will give you a, an idea that how dramatic are the results from, from Gen AI. This is a, a, a quick slide, it's a little busy slide, but it gives you a, you know, some kind of an idea of how dramatic is going to be Gen AI and the impact of Gen AI on the businesses. On 30th of November 2022, OpenAI, a company which was formed by Canadian American uh, engineers, announced a release of ChatGPT. I think in the initial conversation we heard about ChatGPT joke, uh, but it's actually true. You know, so they announced a text based generative AI uh, application and the world was taken by a storm. And and just to give an example, within two months of the launch of uh, ChatGPT, the, the number of users of generative AI increased from zero to 100 million dollars, 100 million users. Now that's a dramatic increase. Uh, we started with practically nothing on 30th of November, and here we are on, uh, on, the, uh, on the 30th of Jan, where you have number of users amounting to almost like 100 million uh, numbers globally. Now, uh, in two months, 100 million, just the comparative numbers, Facebook took four and a half years uh, to reach that 100 uh, million mark. Do you know how much time it took for telephones to cover 100 million? It took 75 years. For the vehicles, it took 35 years. So the, the, the number of adopters of Gen AI was so dramatic that within two months, we saw uh, an uptake of almost like 100 million users worldwide. One more important uh, you know, data point here. Within three months of uh, Jan 2023, we saw five large companies announcing their own LLMs. Now, what is LLM? LLM is a large language model, which is basically a logical integration of uh, a neural network, you know, a logical points, which is connected so that the data which is residing in, in, in source uh, systems can be interpreted in a meaningful manner and you can generate something of value. And that LLMs were created, we all have heard of a, uh, of a platform called Lambda. What is Lambda? Lambda is a large, uh, you know, language model for uh, diagnostic or, or uh, you know, it, for, for basically diagnostic applications. And this is a, a system which is launched by Google, which is currently being used in a very, very popular. There are multiple different platforms that they have created, including BARD, uh, et cetera, which is now currently being used in a commercial manner. So there, you can imagine the, the rapidity and the acceleration that we have seen in the market uh, from practically nothing on 30th of November 2022 to a dramatic increase to almost like uh, you know, 100 million users in, in just about two months. And today, I think the, there are some data points which will make you uh, really wonder as to how, how rapid is the, is the growth of AI. But just a, a quick snapshot of what, what is AI. So general AI basically is, uh, 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 you know, a technique that learn from data and use it to generate a completely new, uh, you know, artifacts, maybe it is image, maybe text, maybe uh, some kind of an object which is of value uh, to the customers. And, and it is much different from AI. I am aware that most of you would, be, would have worked on some kind of AI engines, but Gen AI is actually a next generation of, uh, you know, application set that will actually create value, not just interpret the value. So there is a generative uh, element that is involved in Gen AI and that is something which is of immense value for the businesses. What does it do? So there are four pillars of Gen AI. First is creativity, it generates new stuff. Uh, productivity, it actually does more with less. The third thing is interactivity, it creates humanized experience. You know, you'll see a data point where, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a prediction that by 2028, 60% of B2B transactions are going to be through Gen AI. There won't be any human interface needed. Now that's a, a, a dramatic increase. And the fourth pillar is making things better, that is effectiveness or efficiency factor. So these are the four pillars that actually are, are built or that is the outcome of a generative AI engine. I'll move on. This is the data point. So the, the, from the career option standpoint, if you really look at what uh, is Gen AI uh, as, a, as a career option for, for students, you can see that the market is going to go to almost like two million uh, or two trillion dollars by 2030. That's a prediction. And there are multiple different research reports where you know they have talked about what kind of dramatic growth that is expected in Gen AI. The number of uh, you know sales transactions 
that will happen through uh, Gen AI engine is going to be almost like 60% by 2028. That is all currently manually done. So there is a, a huge opportunity here for, uh, for the student community. The AI adoption as of today is simply dramatic. You know, almost 60% of the respondents uh, from the research conducted by McKinsey's have stated that they are actually doing uh, you know, assessment of, of Gen AI for their own organization and almost 55% have already adopted or in the process of adopting Gen AI. So there is a, a massive disruption uh, in, in the business community due to Gen AI and that is something which is a wave that all of us have to catch on. A quick point of view, this is a point of view of how can we apply Gen AI for manufacturing and ENC industries. So basically if you really look at it, most of the research report will focus on banking, healthcare, high tech, retail industries. There are very, very few applications that have been developed for manufacturing or construction. And this is a great opportunity. I think India is a manufacturing hub. We have to really think of how can we make manufacturing more efficient. And this is one such area where you can actually see that the whole Gen AI engine can really help Indian manufacturing industries to be more efficient, uh, reduce the cost, more competitive in the world market. And this is a point of view that gives you a glimpse of how can Gen AI help you in planning better, costing better, um, real time scheduling better, uh, making the machines more efficient, all of that. And all of these applications are currently at the nascent stage. There is a huge amount of work that is involved. And my strong recommendation to the students is these are the layers of Gen AI. Please look at some of these tiers that are there in Gen AI. Many of them are complex, but most are not complex. If you want to make a career in Gen AI, this is one opportunity that you should not miss. And there are multiple layers. Cloud operations itself is a huge opportunity. Uh, observability, which is like monitoring, you know, observing the performance is another one. Vector databases, foundation models, there are so many things that are there. I think all these are tremendous opportunities for the students at large. And finally, this is a slide which will give you how do you really build your career and a talent and a skill in Gen AI. Uh, as you can see here, the, you know, the growth expected is 27% CAGR. 27% CAGR means that you will double your, uh, your opportunities in three years. You know, and, and that's a huge growth. And uh, there are multiple different levels. You start defining your careers, understand AI, ML, Gen AI uh, courses, uh, look at some of the technology plays uh, like ML, Python, data sciences, um, understand the various different models and like GANs, AEs, VAEs, NLPs. And these are pretty easy to understand. You know, you should make your career, have, use your common sense, have uh, the basic intellect in use for Gen AI development and I can tell you that if you also have the project management expertise, you can create a very, very meaningful uh, career which will be highly rewarding for most of you. That's about it. Thank you so much. Uh, good luck. All the very best.